I mentioned to you now and again that I find unexpected humor sometimes in the scriptures. And today is one of those times we heard this. The Pharisees went off and plotted how they might entrap Jesus in speech. The line always makes me laugh a little bit um, that the Pharisees or anyone think they're going to trip Jesus up uh, in his speech. But it's even funnier in the Greek if you're a language nerd, as I am. In the Greek it says that the Pharisees took counsel about how they might uh, ensnare Jesus and Logoi in his words. In, uh, if you remember John's prologue, in the beginning was the word. In, in Greek it's enarchea hall logos. And it's unlikely that the word hall logos is going to be tripped up in his words, his logoi. But the real reason the Pharisees will never entrap Jesus is not just that Jesus is so much cleverer or something than they. It's because Jesus, who is the truth, always speaks the truth, always speaks truly. And no one gets tripped up in the truth, you know? The Pharisees themselves acknowledge that Jesus speaks the truth. Teacher, we know that you are a truthful man and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. And you are not concerned with anyone's opinion, for you do not regard a person's status. Now, I'm not completely sure from the scriptures whether they meant this or whether they're just trying to set Jesus up. But it is still, nonetheless, those are two true sentences. And they're worth us pondering because in these two sentences, we can find a little, um, I might call it an examination of conscience in them. There are three things in these sentences that we might ponder. So the first one, teacher, we know that you are a truthful man. And so the first question we might ask ourselves is, are we truthful people? And before we answer, we should maybe think of a couple of things. How many times do we tell little white lies? How many times do we stretch the truth? How many times do we spin something? The fact that we use these terms at all <laughs> tell us that we're desperately trying to find a way to excuse or sometimes even justify not telling the truth. I wonder what Jesus thinks about lies, even lies that are little and white. It puzzles me in a way that we even use the word white for something that comes from the Prince of Darkness. Because we know all lies come from the Prince of Lies. In a way, when we say a little white lie, we're using one lie to cover up another lie. As far as the other two, we know what happens when you stretch something or spin something. It eventually loses its shape. You know. Another thing we should ask ourselves before we answer whether, we're not, whether or not we're truthful people is, do we use euphemisms? Euphemisms allow us not to tell the truth and still feel comfortable. As long as we call ourselves pro-choice, for instance, we can fool ourselves into thinking that we are good people trying to do something good. The second thing, teacher, we know that you te teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. It's clear that our culture is moving further and further away 
from what the church knows to be the truth on many things. Preachers and teachers, and even you lay people in your conversations with people, must face up to this. While it is our, not our place to judge people, it is our place and our responsibility to speak the truth to this culture that is wrong about so many things. For instance, there is not your truth and my truth. Those are subjective terms. There is the truth. The word itself means something that stands outside of us, something objective. There is objective truth. There is right and wrong, and we can know it. Another thing we have to speak to this culture is that marriage was created by God, not by human beings. And it's a lifelong, faithful, exclusive, fruitful union of one man and one woman. We have to tell this culture that abortion is not health care for women. We have to tell the culture that our bodies carry meaning. And someone with male genitalia is male. Someone with female genitalia is female. We have to tell our culture that there are only two genders, male and female. And furthermore, that's not hate speech to say that. It's an act of love to say that. Because someone who is confused about that needs help. We have to tell this culture that life continues beyond this world. And apparently, how we live in this world has some effect on where we will spend eternity. The third thing we might look at is, teacher, you are not concerned with anyone's opinion, for you do not regard a person's status. Because that's certainly being afraid or being worried about other people's reaction is something that will keep us from telling the truth. How many times have we said one thing to our coworkers and another thing to our boss? You know? How many times have I heard priests say one thing as we're gathered just among us and then it sounds different somehow when the bishop shows up and they talk about it? How many times have we not been honest about how we truly feel about something because we're afraid someone is not going to like us or be angry at us? And that's not always about necessarily telling the truth. Sometimes we avoid talking about what is true for those reasons. Preachers certainly can fall into that group. How many times have we put keeping the peace above telling the truth? Here's something I ask myself a lot. If the truth will set us free, as Jesus says it will, why do we go to such lengths to avoid it? And here are some reasons, I think. I ran across this website yesterday uh, by accident was called Facing History, Facing Ourselves. And it was, uh, I don't know what all was on there, but it had things about the Holocaust, about racism, some other things. But I thought about that. One of the reasons we avoid the truth is because we avoid, we want to avoid looking at ourselves and seeing ourselves for who we really are. I'll give you a humorous example of this. Uh, years ago, before I was ordained, I liked a woman who was a server at Barleycorns on the river. And so I used to convince my buddies to go down, and we always ended up at Barleycorns, you know, so I could um, work on her a little bit, you know. Always sat, had to sit in her station. 
they put up with it for a while, I guess. But uh, one day they wanted, one night they wanted to leave, and I said, "No, no, man, we gotta stay. I, I gotta talk to so and so." And he says, "Man, she's not really interested in talking to you." He says, oh yeah, she is. She's just busy, you know, because he's like, "Well, where's she been the last ten minutes?" She's busy, busy. He looked at me and he, he said, "Look around, will you?" So I look around, and it dawns on me, we're the only table in her station. <laughs> and I would forget, never forget him looking at me. He said, dude, she's not interested. <laughs> you know, and it finally like, sank in. I go, maybe I'm not all that uh, wonderful uh, guy here or something, you know. But a more serious example is, you know how long it takes people who are addicted to admit to their addiction. How long it takes an alcoholic to finally admit that they're an alcoholic. We don't want it to look at and admit our faults and our failings, you know. Here's another reason uh, we don't look at the truth and admit it is because it will make us change. We don't like to change. I was reading about um, something that General Eisenhower did. He was the supreme commander of the Allied forces in World War II. In 1945, the uh, Americans and British were starting to enter Germany from the west, and the Soviets were starting to enter Germany from the east. And they started to find the concentration camps the first one apparently was one called Ordruf. So three generals came to Ordruf, General Eisenhower, General Bradley, and General Patton. And it must have been awful because General Patton wouldn't even enter it. Now, If you remember General Patton's nickname, Old Blood and Guts, Mr. Tough Guy, would not even enter this camp. But Eisenhower entered and toured it and was appalled. And one of the things he did, there was a German village or town, I, I think about eight miles away, nine miles away. And Eisenhower made everyone in that town come and see this concentration camp to see what had been done and was being done in their name. And then he made all the American soldiers around there go look at it so they could see with their own eyes the evil that they were fighting. You know, less than eight miles away, actually 5.5 miles away, according to Google Maps, is a place where children are dismembered and sucked up into tubes and killed in, I don't know, what other ways. What if Eisenhower gathered us all up and took us over there and made us tour that and see the abortions so that we could see what was being done with our tax money in part? I wonder if that would change some of Catholics' minds about abortion. And I wonder if he took us over there so we could see the evil as he did with the American troops in Ordruf. Would that inspire us? Could we really see, yes, you know what? <laughs> this is really evil. So we can know how serious it is and how much we should fight this thing. How is it possible that people could live eight miles away from a concentration camp and not know what was going on? I think it's much more likely that they didn't want to admit what was going on. They didn't want to know. And I'm afraid it's the same way with us a little bit. We don't want to know. Yes, it, part of it can be because we're squeamish. But people don't like those pictures of abortion when they put those up, you know. I don't like them either. I mean, I don't enjoy looking at them. 
But part of the reason we don't like it is because there's no way of denying once you see that picture what's going on with abortion. And as long as we can keep it out of our consciousness, we can pretend that we're good Catholics, that we're good people. Or as long as we keep trying to shift the focus a little bit, we do that too to keep ourselves from having to grasp the truth or have it grasp us, I should say. But as long as we keep insisting, Father should not be talking about politics from the um, pulpit, the ambo in our case. I heard this uh, this week a few times. I heard it about the sign, you know. And it's neither true according to our Constitution, nor is it true according to our Catholic morality. But if we keep saying Father shouldn't be talking about it, then we don't have to think about what Father is talking about when he's talking about abortion. And we can keep out of our minds, we can continue to ignore the reality that if we vote for certain people, we'll have more abortions. And if we vote for other people, we'll have fewer abortions. Focusing on why Father is talking is a good way of ignoring that truth. Or we focus the attention, we try to refocus the attention another way by continuing to talk about how other issues should be talked about as well. I received a couple of emails about why I'm not talking about the, the death penalty, why I didn't talk about the death penalty last weekend. Now, there are a lot of reasons, and I don't want to get into a, a side homily. But one thing I mentioned to one of them is that in the year 2019, as far as I can tell, there were 24 people in the United States um, executed by the death penalty. And I don't really want anyone to be killed, even guilty. But how Catholics can keep insisting that we should be talking about the death penalty when you compare 24 people being killed against over a million killed, babies killed in 2019 who were completely innocent. Or uh, what's another one of those uh, whole cloth uh, things? Um, oh, the other one I a couple people mentioned the um, immigration where children are being kept in cages, I'm told, you know. Again, we're talking about children being detained compared to children being killed. Again, I, I, I don't want people in cages, but first of all, the issue is more complicated than that. Secondly, to think that's really an election issue, I don't think is going to be a big change. Remember, Trump didn't start all that. President Obama started those edu uh, immigration things that they're talking about. And it's un I doubt whether Joe Biden, who was pre vice president when those were started, is going to change them. I don't, I don't know. But again, if, as long as we talk about that, we can keep ignoring abortion. We live in a culture that does not value objective truth nor real truth telling. And we must be careful not to allow ourselves to be conformed by it. We're supposed to change the culture, not let the culture change us. St. Thomas Aquinas wrote in one of his hymns about Christ, I believe whatever the Son of God said, nothing is truer than this word of truth. If we really want to be followers of Jesus, we have to be as committed to the truth as he, as committed to telling and hearing the truth as he.